Hello guys, how are you all? Welcome back to my channel. So today we are gonna see, what if Naruto was reborn as the daughter of Kakashi? Part 1, subscribe if you enjoy the video, and also check the description. So let's begin the story. I'd always thought that my death would be pretty dull, expected even cancer or disease later in life, maybe a car accident, but I never thought my death would be as outrageous as it actually was. Don't get me wrong, it's not like I sat around planning my death, I just had some general expectations. Well, as it turns out, those expectations were pretty far off. And being electrocuted in front of hundreds of people kind of puts a damper on your high school graduation. Here's what happened. My name had just been called and I was extremely relieved. Having a class of almost 600 seniors makes graduation a tad tedious. Nonetheless it was finally my turn and I walked on shaky legs to the stage at the front. After standing in line with my row for a good 10 minutes I was finally allowed to move. Each row had to stand as their names were called, and I just happened to be the very last person in my row. We had been there, either sitting or standing, for nearly four hours. My row was the second to last to have their names called, which was the main reason why absolutely no one was paying attention. I sighed in relief when my name was called, just a few steps more, and I'd be off the stage with my diploma. As I walked quickly to the principal's podium, I wiped my sweaty palms on my gown and focused on not tripping. I don't usually get nervous for those kinds of things, but I bet anyone would worry about tripping and making a fool of themselves if they were as tired as I was. The too big gown didn't help either. Anyway, I was just about to grab my diploma from Mr. Phillips when our assistant principal cut in front of me to hand him a new microphone. The cordless one he'd been using was giving off a weird echo, so I guess she thought it would be a good idea to try another. I was kind of pissed that she couldn't just wait until after I took my diploma. She took forever trying to untangle the cord it was attached to, and I tried not to let my annoyance show on my face. Oh uh, can't I just graduate already? Turns out, I never would get the chance. Just when Mr. Phillips went to take the new, untangled, microphone, the lights flickered. The microphone dropped to the floor, making a loud whine as it bounced and rolled towards my feet. As the two administrators sent confused glances up to the ceiling I knelt down to pick up the microphone. If I had reached for it with a little less speed, I might have noticed the tangible buzz surrounding my hand as I reached out, but maybe not. Regardless of what might have been, I did pick up the damn thing and trust me I regretted. Why did I have to be such a considerate person? Why couldn't I have just grabbed my diploma and moved on? Just as I started to straighten, with the microphone in my right hand, my muscles tensed up. I remember a strange tingling sensation shooting up my arm followed by extreme pain, then darkness. Long story short, I was electrocuted less than a meter from my high school principal. I was this close to being done with high school at last, then I keeled over. Tragic, right? Seriously. I never even had a chance to get drunk or go to any college parties. When I came back again I couldn't see anything. I could feel my body, vaguely, but it felt strange. I could only move the smallest of distances, and even that was a challenge. And I was exhausted, no, I was beyond exhausted. My brief moment of consciousness ended, sending me back into the darkness I had just left. What felt like an eternity later I surfaced again. This time I remembered graduation and my thoughts were clear. Am I dead? Or just in a coma? I didn't know for sure, but I had a general idea when it came to what happened. I've always been surprisingly quick on the uptake, and this time was no exception. I recognized the tingle for a surge of voltage, and wondered what had happened after I blacked out, or died, whatever. For some strange reason I felt like I had died. As morbid as it was I just didn't have the same sense of self that I only just then noticed I was missing. I didn't really feel like I was a person, I felt ethereal and insubstantial, like a ghost. Now at this point I knew that I should have been panicking, but just as I started to thrash a bit a gentle noise hummed through my ears. Even though I couldn't pick out individual sounds I immediately calmed. Without my panic to distract me I finally started to notice my surroundings. I was floating. At least, I thought I was floating. I wasn't holding my breath or swallowing water, but the sensation was there. I still couldn't open my eyes to see where I was, if I even had eyes, but I could hear some. Everything was muffled, but the hum that had calmed me was easily felt and heard. The hum sounded like someone's voice, but it was indistinct and didn't form any words I could recognize. The noise rose and fell in a soothing rhythm, and soon, I was lost to darkness once more. After that point I rotated through periods of awareness and a blank mindless state. I couldn't even dwell on my death. Every time I did I'd get upset, be comforted by the familiar noise, and fall into unconsciousness almost immediately. It was the frustration that finally convinced me that if I was dead, I was definitely not in heaven. I also didn't think I was in hell, there was no pain and I felt relatively safe. I'd never really thought too hard about what came after death. I wasn't religious, but I wasn't an atheist. 
I think on some level I believed a form of God existed, but I didn't know if my weird state of being was the normal afterlife. If it was, then that sucked because my life, death, wasn't very stimulating. The rotation between awareness and zombiness continued for what felt like an eternity. I'd breach consciousness only to lose it again. In those moments of clarity I'd pray for something, anything, to end the monotony. It's too bad I came to regret that decision the very next time I surfaced again. The last time I woke up in that dark place was a completely different experience compared to all that came before. This time nothing could soothe my panic. It felt like I was being squeezed. The hum that had grown so familiar, so safe, was high-pitched and frantic. My heartbeat, huh, I have a heartbeat again. Was pounding in my ears as my own panic reached a crescendo. The next thing I knew there was cold air around me and a blinding white light seeping through my eyelids. Something large and powerful had me in its grasp. I did the only sensible thing I could do, I screamed. I screamed and wailed in an infant-like pitch until I was placed on something soft and dry. I stopped screaming a few moments later in an attempt to take stock of my surroundings. The problem was, I couldn't see. It was with shock and no small amount of fear that I realized I was being cleaned and dried by hands that were as big as my entire body. The giant hands wiped gunk from my face and body before wrapping me in what felt like a blanket. But the sense of horror and disbelief I assessed my situation. Even in my less than stable mental state, I had enough common sense to guess at what was going on. Was I just a my shit, I just experienced my own birth with a conscious mind. That is so messed up. Once I was sufficiently clean I was placed in someone's arms. I blinked frantically in an attempt to make out the face looming above me. All I could make out was reddish brown hair and dark blue eyes, the individual details were indiscernible. It was then that the face above me started to speak. She cooed and whispered in a soft voice, and I froze in recognition. It was the noise from the darkness, the one that made me feel safe. I was a baby and this woman, the one holding me, was my mother. Huh, guess this isn't a memory. I had wondered if I was just experiencing the beginning of my life or actually being born as a new person, but the face of my new mother sealed the deal. My mom had dark brown, almost black hair and brown eyes. This woman holding me was not my mom, well, she was, just not the mom I remembered. I didn't even cry at the realization. I was still too traumatized from being born. To do anything but stare in open-mouthed shock at the woman who'd given birth to me. Even thinking it was weird. And with my mind completely overloaded I fainted, though to anyone else it probably just looked like I fell asleep. Geez, I was definitely gonna need therapy after this. For some strange reason I couldn't make out anything that anyone was saying, but the incomprehensible noise that my new mom made gave me the same sense of ease that I felt in the womb. I was with her for most of my time in the hospital. She would coo and whisper to me whenever I was awake. Even though I was nearly 18 years old, I was a baby too. I felt unconditional love toward the soft warm person who was my new mother. Whenever she held me in her arms I could feel and hear the steady beat of her heart. It comforted me and reminded me of my time in the darkness. Funnily enough, now that I was out he could appreciate the peace and security I felt in the womb, though I certainly didn't want to go back. Memories of my birth were a different story the screaming and the fear made me suppress the entire ordeal, until it was just a vague recollection at the back of my mind. I wanted to mourn the loss of my mother, the other one, but I couldn't. My baby self had only two settings happy and upset. I could only feel upset if I were hungry, lonely, or needed to be changed. When I tried to remember my old mom I would feel the faintest stirrings of unease and regret, but they quickly faded when my baby mind was distracted by my surroundings. I wanted to wail and scream at my loss. I was betraying my mom, the old one, by getting over her loss so swiftly. Though technically it was my loss, I did die. Death was the only thing that made sense to me. In my previous life I had heard of reincarnation, and I was sure that was what happened to me. I could think of no other reason why I would suddenly be a baby. At the thought I wondered if I would see my old mother and friends again, but I dismissed it. First of all, I didn't know how long it had taken me to reincarnate. Secondly, I was sure the adults around me weren't speaking English if I was in a different country, how would I contact her? Perhaps the scariest reason would be the fact that I didn't even know what I looked like, if I didn't look the same as before then how would she recognize and believe me? Frankly I just didn't know what to do. On some level I wondered if everyone was aware of their birth and just forgot about it later. I wanted that, maybe then my thoughts wouldn't be so confused and I would feel less guilty about loving my new mom. Simultaneously I felt like forgetting would betray her memory and my own. I wouldn't just lose memories of my mother, I would lose my old self. In fact, I could already tell the experience had changed me. I was a baby and a 17-year-old girl. I heaved a sigh and opened my eyes. It had been a few days since my birth and I was lying in a little bed next to a few other newborns. 
I wished I could talk and ask them if they were going through the same thing I was, but I had figured out pretty quickly that all I could do was gurgle or wail. Even if I could I had no guarantee that they'd understand my language or were self-aware at all. Moving was even more of a challenge. I could squeeze my fists shut and wiggle a bit, but real movement was impossible. So I laid there, thinking of my old life, and trying to be upset about it. It was so strange, my conscious mind told me I should be panicking and miserable, but my unconscious mind had already moved on. The most I could work up was some whimpering and twitching, even then it was half-hearted. My baby needs were met. I was warm, full, and sleepy being upset was impossible. I was beginning to realize that my feelings from my old life were gone. All I had left was the knowledge of who I was and how I lived, but I had lost the emotions that went with the memories. I suppose it was what made it so easy to be content in my old life, otherwise I would be freaking out over the fact that I was a baby. So on that day, four days after my birth, I reluctantly let go. With weary resignation I decided that I wasn't getting my old life back, and I decided to fully embrace my new one. I woke up after the next day to the sound of two nurses checking on me and the other newborns. They cooed at us, and I couldn't help but smile at their blurry faces. Now that I accepted my new life I already felt calmer and happier. One nurse picked me up, wrapped me in a blanket, and started walking. She was warm and I wasn't bothered by her presence. Her small even steps were rocking me gently in her arms, and I was hard pressed not to fall asleep again. When we reached our destination she murmured something and ran her fingers over my forehead. Then she handed me over to someone else. I squirmed a bit before the new arms held me close, but relaxed when I recognized the scent of my mom. She held me against her chest, and I noticed she was no longer wearing a white hospital gown. She had a long sleeve blue shirt underneath a black off-the-shoulder tee. Her presence was enough to make me happy. I drifted off to sleep again as she moved about and prepared to leave. I awoke when we finally left the hospital. I studied wavy auburn hair and dark blue eyes. Even with my poor vision I could tell she was beautiful. She had naturally tanned skin and the straightest whitest smile I had ever seen. Her smile was gentle, and she kept her eyes on me as she walked out into the sunshine outside. Sometime while I was asleep she had put on a baby carrier that left me strapped to her chest with my head against her collarbone. Her long hair tickled the top of my head, and I sent her a lazy smile. The gentle sunshine was warm and a moment later I was asleep once more. This time I didn't wake up until we reached our destination. She had just shut a door behind her, and the noise made me shift. Very gently she removed me from the baby carrier and walked to the far end of the room where a portable crib was set up. It was at the foot of a large bed and a few feet away from curtains covering what I assumed was a window. She placed me in the crib and kissed the top of my head before climbing into the bed and collapsing. With some difficulty I turned my head to examine the room. My vision was slightly blurry, but I could see enough to feel confused. It looked like we were in a hotel room. I could see a mini fridge next to a desk and a slightly open door leading into a bathroom. The only other door was the one we had entered through. Either we were in a hotel room, or we were in a verismal apartment. Somehow I doubted we were in an apartment. The ugly curtains and floral bedspread were in bad taste, and I couldn't imagine anyone using them if they had the choice. I wondered if my mom was poor or if she had gone into labor away from home. I only then realized I had no idea what my life was going to be like. I didn't know if my mom had a job or if she had any family. I froze. My quiet musing slammed to a halt. What about my father? I didn't know my father in my previous life because my mom had been 16 when she had me. I had gotten over the fact when I was fairly young, but I wasn't sure I wanted to live without a male figure in my life all over again. The fear that my own flesh and blood didn't love me enough to be there when I grew up hit me hard. It upset me in a way that my death had not. Unlike the distant pain of losing my life, this pain was real and immediate. The thought that I was abandoned again made me feel lonely. Is there something so wrong with me that only one parent can even stand me no matter what life I lead? I couldn't keep silent any longer, and I began to scream at the top of my lungs. The negative emotion sent me over the edge into my first real tantrum. My small throat was already raw by the time my mom picked me up and started rocking me. She looked so tired and I remembered guiltily that she'd gone through childbirth and had spent days in the hospital recovering. She had every right to resent me or to at least feel exasperated, but all I saw in her face was love. I stopped crying and began to sniffle. I had a parent willing to love me and raise me, and this is how I repay her. No. I would be the best daughter she could imagine. It would be the least I could do she had birthed me and already loved me despite the short time we had spent together. But that I finally quieted. I didn't need a dad when I had a devoted parent right here next to me. We fell asleep together on her bed with her arms around me and my head against her chest and the steady beat of her heart in my ears. Ba bump. Ba bump. Ba bump. The first few weeks at home were exciting. My mom was pretty upbeat when it came to her new daughter. 
She would usher me about and was constantly shoving baby toys my way. To be perfectly honest, it was probably a more fulfilling childhood than my first had been. The first time around I had been raised by a teenager struggling to finish high school and a grandmother who wanted nothing to do with me. My mom never stopped smiling. She called me Chidori-chan, and I wondered at the strange name. I had always liked Victoria, but my new name was growing on me. No one else ever came to visit me, so I assumed she had no family or wasn't in contact with them. My new mom was young, probably college-aged if I had to guess. I guiltily wondered if her family had abandoned her when she told them she was pregnant as most people had when my old mother did. She may not have been 16, but she was still fairly young to have a baby. Despite the fact that it was just the two of us, my mom seemed happy. The fact that I was most likely the easiest baby on earth probably helped. I was determined to not complicate her life any more than necessary, I didn't want her to resent me for ruining her life. So with that in mind I almost never cried. I made shrill noises when I was hungry or needed to be changed, and I quieted immediately when she was focused on other things. She took me for walks outside and stopped to let old women and other mothers coo at me. I always smiled and gave my best baby giggles in response, as my mother looked on with a smile of her own. It wasn't hard to pretend to be a happy baby because I wash a pee. I didn't cry when she allowed other people to hold me or pat my head like a normal baby because I knew what was going on. I may not have had a completely adult mind, but I knew enough to understand that they were complimenting me and wouldn't harm me. Without the confusion and fear that other babies felt I was able to remain calm and collected. Every so often I would catch my mom looking a little confused as if she couldn't understand me. When she accidentally got soap in my eyes during my bath and frantically rinsed it out looking ready to cry, I just blinked and sent her my signature lazy smile. When she saw that I was neither upset or hurt, she gave a shaky laugh and stared at me in wonder. I realized I wasn't acting very baby-like, but I felt it was my duty to be the best and easiest baby she could ask for. My mom never seemed to tire. She played with me to the extent that I wondered if she enjoyed the baby games more than I did. I even gurgled happily when she played peekaboo, though it was mostly because she looked ridiculous. She bought new toys all the time. I would wake up to find she had gone out and gotten building blocks or finger paints. I actually enjoyed my life. Not only had I lost the coordination of an adult, but I had also lost the attention span. The toys that should have bored me were a pleasant distraction that I enjoyed. One day she came home with a stuffed animal. It looked to be a scruffy dog, and I immediately loved it. It reminded me of the dog the neighbors in my old life had kept. Back then I had taken care of their dog every time they went on vacation. I was so pleased with it I didn't notice the look on my mom's face until I heard a quiet sniffle. Looking up with my newly clear eyes I saw the tear tracks on her face. She knelt down with a sad smile I'd never seen before and patted my head. Her sadness was contagious, and I felt tears forming in my eyes for the first time since I had wailed at the loss of a father I'd never even had. I clumsily reached my chubby arms up, forgetting the dog's tail was still trapped in my left fist. My mom looked torn between laughing and crying. Oh, Chidori-chan, she scooped me up and held me close, squeezing the dog between us. She carried me to the bed and lay down with me in her arms. She held me to her chest and cried quietly as I sniffled into her shirt. We fell asleep and when I awoke she was once again the joyous woman I had come to know. After a few months had passed I was finally starting to pick up the language. I couldn't speak clearly, but I could manage a gargled kachan when my mom picked me up. Though I couldn't really communicate I was able to understand what everyone else was saying. I felt really silly when I figured out my name was actually just Jadori and that Chan was an honorific. Being able to understand what people were saying made things way more interesting. I especially loved going out to shop once I could pick up on what others were saying to my mom. Good afternoon Honda-san. Hello Akiyama-san. Chidori-chan is looking as cute as ever, has she started crawling yet asked the old man who owned the tea shop. My mom always stopped by after shopping for produce further up the road. He was tall and thin with a scruffy gray beard that reached halfway down his chest. Just a little bit, but I'm beginning to think that she's purposely giving up just so she can be carried around said my mother with a soft laugh. What makes you say that? Five months is incredibly early for a baby to be crawling, I'm still surprised that she can speak cried the old man. He'd been utterly shocked when I'd cried Kachan in front of him a month previously. Speaking was an exaggeration, but a few words were still impressive at my age. Oh there's no doubt she's a little genius confessed my mother, but I've caught her crawling around whenever I'm not in the room. She always stops as soon as she sees me and throws her arms up to be carried. Honda san laughed at that and brought my mother her tea. I was stuck in an uncomfortable baby carrier, but I didn't complain. My mom never stayed long. She and Honda san exchanged a few words more about my laziness as I pouted, and soon we were on our way home. It turns out the room we'd originally been staying in had been a hotel. 
When I was a month old we had left the hotel and moved into a nice apartment not too far away. It had two bedrooms, two bathrooms, a kitchen, and a spacious living room. I had no idea where she got the money, since I'd never seen her work or do anything other than take care of me, but I didn't worry too much about it. From what I'd heard from those my mom spoke to, she had come to the small town we lived in only a few months before giving birth. She never answered questions about her family or my father, and so I had no knowledge of her life before I came along. Once my mom realized that I didn't wake up crying like most babies she started leaving in the middle of the night, only to come back hours later covered in sweat. She wasn't gone long enough for me to think it was a job, and she always wore workout clothes, which ruined my idea that she was sneaking out to see a man. I didn't know why she had to work out in the middle of the night, but she always did, and eventually it just became part of our normal routine. For the most part I lived a quiet life, and I expected it to continue indefinitely. Imagine my shock when she started talking about leaving our little town just two days after her conversation with Honda-san. We had just walked through the front door to our apartment when she started talking. She spoke to me pretty often, though I don't think she realized how much I understood. I'm going to have to go back at some point sweetie she sighed. As nice as this is, I need to start taking missions again. The hokage only gave me time off until you were six months old. She looked miserable, and I reached my little hand up to clumsily pat her cheek. Inside I was reeling, she was talking about leaving everything I had ever known. I didn't know what she meant by missions or what the hokage was, and I could only wait for her to continue. At least I'll be able to see my friends again. I'm sure they love you Chidori-chan. They'll take care of you whenever I have to go on mission she was looking a little happier as she said this. All of a sudden her face fell, but I never told him about you. I stayed quiet, I had the feeling she was talking about my father. I know I should have, but I wasn't supposed to get pregnant. I left without telling anyone, let alone him. Maybe he won't even believe me she paused, looking thoughtful. I did leave shortly after I found out about you. What if he never finds out? She stared at me before hanging her head, oh, who am I kidding? You're his spitting image. The hokage will realize the truth as soon as he sees the resemblance, and he'll make me tell your father. She broke down into tears as I reeled with the new information. For the second time in my short lifetime she fell asleep crying as she held me against her chest. A week later my mom had the apartment packed up and the furniture sold. We went around saying our goodbyes to all the villagers we had come to know. I spent the day practicing the words, bye bye and made sure to smile happily at all the people who'd called me cute. They made silly exclamations about my gargled words and pinched my cheeks. My mother looked sad and gave hugs to all the women she'd become friends with. Finally, as evening approached, she grabbed the bags with her clothes, my toys, and all the picture books she'd gotten me and we were off. We caught a ride on a farmer's cart and waved our final goodbyes as we rolled away. I fell asleep fairly quickly and only woke up when the cart rolled to a stop. The farmer was a kind middle-aged man, and he set about starting a fire while my mom took out her sleeping roll. While the farmer moved into the woods to gather firewood my mom fed me with a bright pink bottle, before taking out a protein bar and a bottle of water. She ate quickly, spoke with the farmer some, and crawled under her blanket with me in her arms. I could tell she was still awake, but couldn't stay awake long enough to wait for her to fall asleep. The next day of travel was boring, and my mom just held me on her lap in the back of the cart. Once again I tried to wait for her to fall asleep and failed miserably. The next morning we reached a town a bit bigger than the one we had come from. We parted ways with the farmer and spent the night in a quaint little inn. As she lay down in the bed next to me I heard her breathing deepen, and when I looked up she was asleep. It was as I suspected, my mom had stayed up those nights on the road. I knew she was suspicious even though I couldn't understand why. I'd noticed the way she always darted her eyes as though looking for a threat and the way she walked silently. Now I wondered if the man who was my father had beaten her, and I was afraid to meet him. Nonetheless we continued on our journey the next day, this time traveling with a wealthy looking merchant. The next three days of travel were slow and tedious. I became a little fussy despite my best efforts. I was still a six-month-old despite my memories, and I was ready for the journey to be done. My mom, on the other hand, looked more and more anxious as we drew closer to our target. I was starting to think she really did fear my father, why else would she be so upset? I decided before meeting him that he was an abusive idiot and that I wouldn't like him. I was set straight the night before we reached our destination. The merchant and his hired helpers were already asleep, and my mom was leaning against a tree with me in her lap. It was an impressive tree. Even though everything loomed large above me I could tell the trees around us were more than just large, they were huge. Ok Chidori-chan, we're almost there she gave me a sheepish smile before continuing. I'm sorry I kept you away from your dad. I just wasn't sure how he'd react to being a father without any say in the matter. She looked up into the treetops and sighed, he's nice, he's handsome, and he's brave, but he doesn't love me. 
I was afraid he would think I did it on purpose to try to get him to marry me, but that wasn't it. I stared into her face with wide eyes. I was infatuated and I knew that so long as I didn't push for a real relationship, he would keep me around she sighed. He's a great guy and I know that he'll do his best by you, that's just the kind of person he is. As she continued to talk about a man she clearly loved and respected I zoned out. I knew it was naive to hope for the best. I squashed the relief I felt at hearing I had a father who might be involved in my life and instead focused on my mom. I loved my mom and it was heartbreaking to hear her talk about loving a man who she was sure would never return the favor. I decided to remain loyal to her and her alone. If my father couldn't love her then he was a fool and undeserving of my attention. I snuggled into my mother with that in mind and drifted to sleep with all the ease of the baby I appeared to be. When I finally woke up it was to raise voices and laughter. The merchant and the six he traveled with were eager to be done with the journey it seemed. I stirred in my mom's arms and looked up at her. She was clenching her jaw, and her posture was stiff. Morning Koch and I whispered, though it sounded more like morning Koch. She looked down at me and smiled for my benefit, morning sweetheart. The carriage we were sitting in slowed to a stop, and she put on the baby carrier and lowered me into it. Once we came to a complete stop she hopped down and moved to the cart behind us to take our bags. Now that we were out of the carriage I could see the enormous walls we had come to. They stretched for what seemed like forever to both sides and met in front of us in the form of a large open gate. The merchant we joined was pulling out papers in front of a small building just inside the gates. My mom took a deep breath and made her way over to the same building with me strapped to her chest and our bags in her hands. As we got closer I saw two men wearing strange clothes and matching green vests. I assumed they were some kind of guards or gatekeepers for the village we were entering. The first had a bandage of sorts across his nose and dark spiky hair, he was busy looking over the merchant's papers and ignored us. My mom went to stand in front of the second without saying a word. As she waited for him to notice us I saw that both he and the other guard were wearing headbands that matched my mom's belt. She hadn't worn it before today, but it was the same metal plate with the same leaf insignia. Not for the first time I wished I could speak fluently so I could question my mother. The man took what felt like an eternity to acknowledge us. Papers please he said at last without looking up from the scroll he was reading from. I was just thinking it odd that he was reading from a scroll rather than a book when my mother answered, really Azumo-kun. You don't recognize me? It hasn't been that long. He looked up quickly, and I noticed that his hair covered his right eye. Kaoru-chan. Akiyama Kaoru, is that you? The first man looked up at my mother's name, Kaoru. Where have you been? It's been a year since anyone has heard from you. It has been a while since Katetsu-kun, Azumo-kun. I've missed you guys. The man named Izumo looked shocked, we wondered what had happened to you. The Hokage wouldn't tell us where you went, he just said you'd taken time off for personal reasons. For the first time he seemed to see me in my baby carrier. The second man followed Izumo's eyes and looked at me too. Um Kaoru, is that your baby? Yeah, she's mine. That's why I've been gone so long she answered quietly. I had my head turned at an awkward angle to watch the exchange, and my neck was hurting. The two men shared a look. Who's her, um, you know, the man named Katetsu looked sheepish. My mom didn't answer. Instead, she put the bags down and gently lifted me from the baby carrier. Once I was free she turned me around to face them and removed the cap she put on my head. When they saw my hair they gasped. I didn't understand until I recalled what my mom had said about my looks, apparently I look like him. I didn't even know you were dating. My mom cut him off, we weren't, not really. Silence fell. The merchant who'd been standing off to the side throughout the exchange looked uncomfortable. When he cleared his throat Katetsu apologized and went back to examining his papers. My mom made some excuse about seeing the hokage, and after putting my hat on and picking up the bags she waved goodbye. I peeked over her shoulder and saw the two men looking after her as she walked away. The village we were in was less a village and more like a sprawling city, though I didn't see any cars. I wondered about that. Whatever country I was in had technology, but not to the extent that I was used to. It was weird, the people I saw had the weirdest mixture of hair colors, but spoke a language that I'd finally identified as Japanese. For the life of me I couldn't figure out where we were. Most of the people we passed ignored us, but there were others who stared in shock. The ones who noticed us and turned to whisper to their friends, all had green vests, or if not, at least had the weird metal headband that my mom wore as a belt. Some looked as though they wanted to speak to my mother, but she just shook her head and kept walking. We made our way deeper into the city until a strange mountain loomed before us. It reminded me of Mount Rushmore, though the faces carved in stone were definitely not former presidents. At this point I was really curious as to where we were. I tried to point to the faces with a questioning look, but my mom just patted my head and ignored me. Put out, I settled for lying against her chest until we reached our destination. 
It was only a few minutes later when my mom opened the door and walked into the building. I picked my head up and looked around. We were in what looked like a busy waiting room. People in those metal headbands were running about much faster than I'd ever seen anybody move. Ignoring all the chaos, my mom walked up to a woman at a desk and said, Excuse me, I'm here to see the Hokage. Name please. Akiyama Kaoru. They squinted at my mother before saying, He's left instructions that you be sent to see him whenever you get here. You're free to head up. My mom nodded and made her way to the stairs on the far side of the room. Moments later she was putting her bags down to knock on a large wooden door. Come in called a male voice. My mother picked up her bag and shifted it under her arm so she could open the door. As we entered the room I noticed three things. The man who'd spoken was extremely old, he had an insane view of the village from the window behind his desk, and his outfit was really weird. Hayori san is that you he said with a smile. Then he noticed me. So that's why you wanted so much time off. I'm sorry Hokage-sama. I should have told you, but I'm afraid I wasn't in the best mental state at the time. I can imagine he said. Who's the father? Does he know? My mom winced, no Hokage-sama. I didn't know how he would respond to the news, and so I took the cowardly route and ran away. As for the father's identity, she trailed off. Once again she set her bags down and freed me from the baby carrier. The Hokage just raised an eyebrow and waited for her to continue. She pulled off my cap as she had done before and whispered, I think it's fairly obvious when you see her hair. I was uncomfortable with the situation but didn't let it show. My hair was nothing like my mother's auburn waves, and my eyes were an even deeper blue. I was paler as well. I could only assume my father looked similar if everyone could figure out his identity just by looking at me. Oh well, might as well make the best of it. I tilted my head to the side and shot a lazy smile towards the old man, Monning. The Hokage looked shocked and amused at the same time. I can certainly see the resemblance, but how old is she? She doesn't look old enough to be speaking. Oh she just looks young for her age, she's nearly 6 months old. She is advanced though Chidori-chan has been able to say simple words since she was a little over 4 months old. Chidori-chan. My mother blushed, I thought it was fitting. It certainly is the Hokage turned a disapproving gaze on my mother. You should have told him. He has a right to know about his own daughter. I know, Hokage-sama, I realize that now. It's just, well, we didn't really have a conventional relationship, and I didn't want to upset him or make him uncomfortable. Regardless of how he would respond he still had the right to know my mother hung her head. Though I think he may surprise you added the old man. I was getting tired of this. It wasn't my mom's fault. She was in a difficult situation and made the best of it. So far, she'd been an amazing mother, she didn't deserve to be reprimanded. I stared at the old man, no. Bod. He looked shocked for a moment before he started laughing. My mom looked at me blankly before chuckling herself. I'm surprised she could pick up on the fact that I was scolding you. How advanced did you say she was again? My mom smiled, I'm beginning to think even I don't know how special she really is. The Hokage's smile faded, you need to see him, Kaoru-san. I'll give you time to get back home, but I'm sending him over in a few hours. He's just returned from a mission in Wave Country. I'll leave it to you to tell him. Yes, Hokage-sama. An hour later my mom had taken me to a dusty apartment much like the one we'd been living in for the past few months. She'd taken out a blanket and had put me on the floor with my stuffed dog. Its grey fur was ruffled looking, and I was petting it like a real dog to smooth it out. My mom cleaned as I played and made tea when she finished. When I saw that she had finished cleaning I held up my dog, Wu she smiled and sat on the floor next to me before taking the scruffy toy and moving it about. She had it run over the floor and tackle me, all the while making barking noises. I laughed and made my own barking noises in response. I was so caught up in the game that I failed to notice my mom staring behind me towards the door. The dog stopped running about so I grabbed its tail and lifted it from my mom's grasp, woof. Only then did I notice the panic on my mom's face. I turned to see a man in a mask standing just inside the apartment with the door wide open behind him. The mask covered his mouth and nose, and the metal headband I kept seeing covered one of his eyes. I ran into Katetsu and Izumo and they said it was important, but they didn't say the man couldn't continue. He looked at my mother, then me, back to my mother, before finally settling his gaze on me. At this point I could guess at his identity from his actions alone, but it was his hair that caught my attention. It was the same silvery color as my own, maybe a bit darker, but just as spiky. When he remained frozen and my mom refused to speak I decided that I was going to have to act as an adult. Hello I said with a smile before holding up my dog, woof. He didn't move, but his gaze switched to my mother, Kaoru, is she? Yes Kakashi. She's your daughter. Yes Kakashi. She's your daughter. I was thoroughly enjoying the panic look on my father's face, well, what I could see of his face. Huh, I guess I didn't lose all aspects of my old personality after all. 
is still enjoy other people's misfortune. I knew it was a big moment and all, but I couldn't help but laugh at his expression. Thankfully, my giggle went unnoticed. He was staring at my mother as if she'd sprouted another head. Is that why you left? My mother nodded, I was afraid to tell you. How old is she? What's her name? She's nearly six months old, her name is Jadori. He glanced back at me, cute name dot it appeared he was calming down, she's okay right? Healthy and all that. Of course Kakashi. If anything, she's a genius my mom moved to pick me up. As she stood I let my dog fall to the ground. She moved closer to him, would you would you like to hold her? He seemed frozen in place. Uh, I guess so if it's alright my mom gave him a small smile and handed me over. His arms were bigger than my mother's, and I felt small. He looked down at me and I stared back. I had expected anger or denial, but if anything he just seemed shocked. My mom was looking more sure of herself and I was laughing in my head. I didn't think it would be like this there was no resentment. My parents were totally clueless on how they were supposed to do this, it was endearing. When my father looked at me I could tell he was confused, frightened, and maybe a little bit proud. He wasn't the idiot I'd been expecting. I was relieved that my mother hadn't been blinded by her infatuation, he really did seem like the good guy she thought he was. You could have told me he finally said. I wouldn't have been mad. She's my daughter too, and I would have liked to see her grow. My mom burst into tears, I'm sorry Kakashi. I didn't know what to do and it was so unexpected, the rest of what she said was indecipherable through her sobs. As always when my mother cried I started to cry too. Kakashi looked unsure as to what to do, Kaoru. She pulled herself together and took me from his arms. She carried me to her bedroom with Kakashi following uncertainty. I was placed in her bed with pillows on either side so I didn't roll off. Chidori-chan needs to sleep. We can talk back in the living room. He just nodded and followed her out after shooting me another glance. I was disappointed, I had wanted to see the way things turned out. I debated crying but dismissed that idea quickly, I didn't want to scare my new father away. I was happy and I hoped he would want to be a part of my life. From the little I'd seen of him I thought he would and I was glad. As much as I thought I didn't need a father I still wanted one. He was nice to my mother too, despite what she'd done. I strained to hear what they were saying, but all I could make out was a muffled echo. If only I didn't have to sleep so much as a baby. I was frustrated at my exclusion, but it didn't last. I was exhausted from all the change moments later I was falling asleep to the hushed tones of my parents. When the sun rose the next morning I found my mother snoring softly next to me. I stared up at the ceiling and wondered what decision my parents had come to on how I was going to be raised. I shifted slightly, suddenly hungry. My mom stopped snoring immediately, and I felt guilty for waking her. Morning sweetie she mumbled. Well, if she was already awake hungry. Kai-chan is hungry. My mom laughed. Well if Kai-chan is hungry I guess I'd better feed her. She got up slowly, stretched and carried me into the living room. She put me down on the same blanket as the night before so she could walk into the kitchen. I rolled onto my stomach and picked at the blanket while she messed about fixing breakfast. By the time she was done I was being fed a mushy substance that tasted like apples, and my mom was drinking tea. We finished eating and my mom picked me up once more. Let's get cleaned up. That bath yesterday was great after all that travel, but I could definitely go for another. I clapped my hands together and she took me into the bathroom with her. Once the tub was full of warm water she climbed in and put me on her lap. She washed me first with baby soap and was careful to avoid my eyes. Then she let me splash around a bit before taking me out and wrapping me in a towel. I was dried thoroughly and left sitting on the towel as she climbed back in to wash her hair. When she was finished she drained the tub and climbed out, wrapping herself in the other towel as she did so. I lifted both arms up and she carried me back to the bedroom. She gave me a new diaper and dressed me in a light blue honesty with white flowers on it. With her favorite comb, she tried to tame my hair. As always she gave up after a few minutes. For some reason my hair just wouldn't lie flat, and after seeing my father's hair I didn't think it ever would. Once she was satisfied with my appearance she gave me my dog and left me to crawl around on the floor as she dressed. She wore black pants that she wrapped against her calves, and a dark green tube top over a long-sleeved shirt that looked like it had wires in it. Then she put on her standard sandals and tied the sash with the metal rectangle around her hips. I looked at it and pointed as I made a series of noises that were decidedly not word like My mom followed my finger and looked down at the leaf insignia. Oh this. This is my hit I ate. I wear it because I'm a Kinoichi. I gave her a blank look. I'm a ninja. Like in the stories we read. My blank look remained, and my mom ruffled my hair and started strapping little pouches to her hips. What? I had been so sure my mom was sane. A ninja. Is she messing with me? We had plenty of children's stories about Shinobi and their brave tales, but I didn't recall her ever saying she was one. I decided that either I had misunderstood or she was just teasing me. 
Either way, my mom did not think she was a ninja, that would be too silly. Her next words however, pushed ninjas out of my mind completely. Alright Chidori-chan, your dad is going to take you today. I need to get back to work and start training again. This way you'll get acquainted, and I don't need a babysitter. She was smiling and looked truly happy for the first time since we had left our old village. I, however, was not smiling. I stared at her with my mouth and an oh I couldn't believe she was abandoning me to a stranger already. Sure he was my dad, but I had only met him yesterday. How could she trust him to take care of me? She had barely ever let anyone hold me, let alone take care of me for a day. A knock on the door had me closing my mouth and my mother scrambling to tie up her hair. But the quick glance in the mirror she nodded, scooped me up, and went to answer. The O said the tall, silver-haired man. My mom smiled up at him as my mind went spinning out of control. She was betraying me. I didn't know this man, he didn't know how to take care of a baby. Hey Kakashi. Come on in she called over her shoulder as she made her way to the kitchen. She grabbed two bottles, some baby food, diapers, and a blanket. She shifted me to her other hip as she reached into a drawer and pulled out a scroll. Here, take Kai-chan while I seal up her stuff. She didn't wait for an answer and thrust me into his arms. We sent perplexed and overwhelmed glances at each other, clearly my new father didn't know what to make of the situation either. When I looked back to my mother all the things were gone and she was rolling the little scroll up. Wait, where did everything go geez, this day was getting more and more confusing. My mom handed the scroll over to Kakashi and he shifted me to one arm to take it. Alright, I need to go to Anbu headquarters and get my superiors caught up. Taking care of Chidori is really easy. She can speak some and understands even more, she won't cry either. But when you meet with your team, be careful Chidori's never been around kids before and I don't want her to be overwhelmed, okay? Sure he answered, still clearly overwhelmed himself. Great. I Chidori Chan and with that she kissed me on the head and dragged us out the door. She closed and locked it behind her and took off running with a wave, have fun she disappeared down the stairs and left us there, together. I gulped. Well, that was interesting. Kakashi stuffed the scroll into a pocket and lifted me up by my armpits. He held me up for a moment and examined me with his one visible eye. I stared back, determined to remain calm. Ma, you'll do. Dot. I nearly choked. Was that meant to be a joke? He moved me so I was resting against his chest and started walking. I pouted I'll do it. What does that even mean? His casual manner may have put me at ease, but it was still weird. He carried me down the stairs and out of the apartment building and into the sunshine. I yawned happily. I loved warm weather both in my old life and now, it was so relaxing and peaceful. This more than anything made me calm down. Nothing bad ever happens on days as nice as this one was. As he walked I decided that he wouldn't dare treat me badly after all, if he did, he'd have to face my mom. I had the distinct feeling my mom's boundless energy intimidated him, hell, it intimidated Mesem times. With that in mind I made the decision to just go with the flow. If I really wanted a father I'd have to get used to the idea of spending time with him. I snuggled into his chest and prepared to nap. I always slept better in my mother's arms and I figured it would be the same for another's. He stiffened at first and I smirked I was making him uncomfortable, and it was, well, kind of cute. He slowly relaxed and gave my head an awkward pat with his free arm. I giggled, I was so going to enjoy torturing my new dad. I yawned again. Humph, I guess I'd have to wait until after my nap to mess with him. Smiling once more I shut my eyes and drifted off. My new dad was still walking when I stirred. He noticed the movement and shifted me to his other side. I lifted my head up and blinked in the sunshine. As my eyes adjusted I took in our surroundings. There were shops on either side of the road, and I could smell food in the air. I looked around eagerly for the source of the smell, wishing I was allowed to eat real food. I spotted a little food stand selling what looked like pastries. My mouth watered, if only I had teeth damn. I turned away from the food I knew I couldn't have and looked instead at a flower shop. It too smelled delicious, but in a different way. Through the window I could see all sorts of beautiful flowers. I looked up into the eye I could see, the dark blue one so similar to my own, and I pointed to the flower shop. He raised an eyebrow in response. Smiling sweetly I pointed to myself and then back to the flower shop. With a sigh he turned and walked into the flower shop. Once inside he turned me around in his arm so I was facing all the flowers. I squinted and tried to figure out which one I wanted. I was torn between a bright yellow sunflower and a calla lily. In the end though, I couldn't resist the brightness of the sunflower. I pointed towards it and Kakashi walked over to it. Is there something I can help you with Haddock-san? I'd like to buy a sunflower if that's alright he drawled. Of course, though if I may ask, who's the little girl? My daughter. The woman looked puzzled, so I tilted my head and gave her a smile, Monin. She squealed, oh she's so adorable. May I hold her I tensed up a little. The calm elegant air was gone instantly. 
I'm always a little put off by excess energy when it's someone I'm not familiar with, and I looked up at my dad with pleading eyes. This woman's abrupt change was downright scary. Actually, if I could just buy the flower I'd be late to meet my team. The woman looked put out, oh, okay. I'll ring it right up. Roughly three minutes later we were back on the street, and I had a large sunflower in my hand. I glanced back towards the shop and heaved a sigh of relief. My dad noticed and chuckled under his breath. I was grateful that he had saved me from that woman. Something about her just made me want to shudder in fear. I resolved to put it out of my mind and sniff the flower, feeling better after doing so. The cashier adjusted his grip on me and made his way out of the busy area. I poked the sunflower's petals and sniffed it again. It was so perfect that I doubted it was real, but after sniffing twice I couldn't deny it the flower was authentic. Inspiration struck me and I lifted the sunflower up as high as I could. I practically shoved it into my father's face. He looked startled for a moment, but when I tapped my nose with my other hand he got the picture. He wrinkled his eyes up as if he were smiling. Yes Jadori chan the flower smells nice. I grinned and brought it back down to sniff it myself. It was odd how such simple things made me happy. I was still petting the flower like I would a dog when I noticed our surroundings had changed drastically. We were now in a large clearing with a stream on one side and trees on all other sides. There were even three upright logs at one end of the clearing with dings and scratches in them. Huh, I didn't even recall how we'd gotten here. One second we were surrounded by shops the next. You're late. I winced at the sudden noise. Turning my head a little I noticed three figures standing a little ways away. Yo called my father. There were two boys and a girl. They were children, probably between 10 and 13, though I couldn't be sure. The girl and the blonde boy had been the ones to shout, the third just scowled. I gaped at the girl's hair it was pink. I mean, I've seen some weird hair colors lately, but pink. Where in the world is pink hair normal? Even her eyebrows matched, it looked natural. She was pretty, I guess, with the cotton candy hair and her green eyes, but still strange. Thankfully, the boy's appearances were less startling. Though the one with the bright orange jumpsuit had whiskers. No, they were just lines. The other one had dark hair, dark eyes, and less outrageous clothes. What's with the baby shouted the blonde in the jumpsuit. I grimaced, my ears were still sensitive. Shut up Naruto. Stop shouting, you're scaring the baby she shouted back. Great. Another loud one. Alright team, I would appreciate it if you stopped screaming in front of my daughter, okay said Kakashi in his usual drawl. He sounded amused, but I appreciated the fact that he'd noticed how the noise was affecting me. Since when do you have a brat asked the dark haired kid. He was still scowling. I bristled at the term brat, but ultimately ignored it when I realized I couldn't retaliate. Apparently since 6 months ago said Kakashi. Her name's Yadori chan The girl was already cooing at me and grabbing my tiny hands in hers. I smiled at her, at least someone appreciates my cuteness. The blonde kid stepped closer and went to poke me in the cheek. I flinched and closed my eyes, but the poke never came. When I opened my eyes we were behind the group of kids. Ma, I'm going to have to ask you to give her some space. Little Kai-chan here is just a baby after all. They jumped at his voice and spun around. They too had no idea how we'd gotten behind them. Anyway, let's have you practice tree walking before we move on with training. The kids grumbled at that, but moved away to each stand in front of one of the trees at the edge of the clearing. I looked on curiously as they lifted their feet and ran vertically up the tree trunk with the hell. I was officially freaking out, how was that even possible? I leaned my head back to stare into my dad's masked face. He was looking at me curiously. I looked back at the freaky monster children and squeaked at the sight of them standing sideways on the trees, arguing about something. Ai Chan do you know what chakra is he asked me with his eyes crinkled in a smile. I just stared at him blankly. I wondered at the nickname for a moment before I remembered my mom using it in front of him early in the morning. He walked a little ways away from the demon children and jumped up onto one of the logs in the ground. I gasped a little at the jump before he sat down and put me on his lap. Once we were settled he reached forward and put his hand in front of me. I stared at his hand in wonder. It was glowing. A blue glow surrounded his hand, and there was no flashlight anywhere I could see. Hesitantly I reached out to touch his hand. When I finally did I felt the oddest tingling sensation in my fingertips, and I laughed. No longer wary, I stuck my other hand out to join my first. The tingling sensation felt so cool. I took my hands away and it disappeared, and as soon as I touched his hand again the feeling returned. I clapped and went off in excited baby gibberish. I didn't even try to form words, I just made random noises to express my excitement. I was so caught up that I didn't notice the three kids returning from their tree exercise until the blonde kid spoke up. Na, Kakashi-sensei, what do we know I stopped playing with the blue light and looked up, startled. My dad let the light fade away and turned his attention back to the children. Hmm, I can't really think of any training. 
I guess I'll give you guys a mission today then drawled Kakashi. He reached into his pouch and pulled out a scroll similar to the one my mother had given him, only without the ribbon tied around it. He tossed it in the air, and the blonde, Naruto, made a clumsy attempt to catch it. He yanked the scroll open, and the other two went to read it over his shoulders. A moment passed, Aw, Kakashi-sensei. Why do we have to do a dumb mission like this? The pink-haired girl nodded, yeah, isn't weeding a little too easy for us? We can handle more, you know dot the scowling boy didn't say anything, but he nodded. I looked up to see Kakashi scratching his head. If it's so easy it should be done twice as fast then. Maybe I'll give you a more dangerous mission after. Dangerous? Like rescuing a princess, fighting bandits, or something like that. Nah, tell us Kakashi-sensei whined Naruto. He was about to continue when the girl punched him in the head and effectively shut him up. Thank you Kakashi-sensei. We'll go and get this done. The dark-haired kid was already walking away, and the girl chased after him, dragging Naruto by the back of his jumpsuit. Once they were out of sight I heard a heavy sigh. My dad lifted me up and jumped back down to the ground. It was so gentle that I probably wouldn't have noticed the movement if my eyes were closed. He stared at me for a moment before saying, I really hope you don't turn out like any of them. It was said so seriously that I snickered, well, as much as a baby can snicker. I agreed wholeheartedly with the sentiment. Those were some weird little pre-teens. A few minutes after the demon children had left I was placed on the ground so my dad could search his pockets. I was looking around in an attempt to find my sunflower as he patted himself down. I glanced around and spotted it lying in the dirt by the upright log. Oops, I must have dropped it when his hand started glowing. I had just started to crawl over to get it when the masked man finished his search. But the subdued aha he opened the scroll my mother had given him and placed it on the ground a few feet away from where I was sitting. I stopped moving and looked over at the strange scene. Curious, I watched as he pressed his thumb down in the middle of a strange looking symbol. His thumb glowed briefly with the blue light from before, and I stared with my mouth wide open, as white smoke condensed in a little cloud and faded, leaving all the things my mom had gathered earlier in the day. I couldn't even come up with an imaginary friend in my old life, now I'm dreaming up scenes straight out of the magic act. I shook my head in disbelief. Things had been wacky all day. First the ninja conversation, then the freaky kids, and now this if it were possible, I had no doubt that I'd check myself into an insane asylum. My day was turning out to be some weird down the rabbit hole experience, and I was not enjoying it. Of course this reminded me of shrinking, tea, and creepy cats. I shuddered, that movie had always creeped me out, even death wasn't enough to cure my dislike. At this point you may be wondering why I was choosing to focus on an old Disney movie, rather than my predicament. Frankly I just couldn't deal with the unfamiliar weirdness, so I focused on a familiar kind of weird. That, and my baby mind tended to get distracted and go off on tangents if I wasn't careful. By the time I surfaced from my reverie I belatedly noticed that my father had spread my blanket over the ground and stacked my other things to one side. He walked over to me, picked me up and placed me on the clear side of the blanket. I was still somewhat in a daze, and it took me a moment to see the bottle Kakashi held in front of me. I stared at it, uncomprehending, before letting my eyes drift away. Suddenly my focus returned as I spotted the scroll, still lying in the grass. Maybe I could come up with a reasonable explanation for all this. I crawled over slowly and made my way to the edge of the blanket. I leaned towards the scroll and carefully reached towards the symbol. I held my breath and poked it quickly, drawing my finger back as fast as I could. Nothing happened. I heard a soft laugh and looked up. My dad had moved so he was squatting across from me, and even with the mask on I could have sworn he was smirking at me. I didn't bother to get worked up, I was too preoccupied with the magic scroll in front of me. I gave my best impression of puppy eyes and gestured to the scroll. In response he took my bottle and put it on top of the scroll. He then deliberately lifted a finger and moved it towards the scroll. I followed his glowing finger with wide eyes as he gently pressed the scroll. A moment later the bottle was gone and white smoke was already dissipating. Once again I was left confused and astounded. I wasn't crazy, hopefully, but I couldn't figure out what was happening. I examined the scroll and saw nothing out of the ordinary, though I couldn't be sure since the symbols were incomprehensible to me. I then came to the conclusion that my father's blue glow was responsible. It was, after all, something very clearly magical. Eager to make sense of the trick I crawled into his lap and grabbed his hand. He just looked on with a bored expression as I prodded his hand with my chubby fingers. He had black fingerless gloves on, and I pulled at the material to see if I could detect anything strange. When I couldn't, I leaned in and stared hard at his fingertip. Finally, after finding only the normal swirl of his fingerprint, I gave up and leaned back against his stomach. Seeing that I was done with my impromptu investigation, he freed his hand and reached for the remaining bottle. As he did so I noticed my hunger for the first time. 
From the placement of the sun I guessed it was around 1 o'clock, the time I usually fed and took my afternoon nap. Babies are notorious creatures of habit and I was no exception. I greedily drank and gave in to the drowsiness that followed, hoping that when I woke up things would make sense again. I woke up after roughly two hours, if I had to guess. My naps tended to be frequent, not lengthy. As I shook off the last of my lethargy I rolled onto my stomach. I was still on the blanket in the clearing, and the sunflower I'd forgotten about was now next to my head. I smiled and reached for it with my tiny fist. Just as I was about to grab it I remembered the events that had occurred before my nap. I snapped my eyes wide open and surveyed the scene around me. It was silent, with only the sound of a light breeze rustling through the trees. I was the only thing on the blanket all the baby items had disappeared, aside from my stuffed dog, which I hadn't seen earlier. I was left alone in the gentle sunshine. Something about that made me uneasy, Thini recalled the fact that I was a baby and as such should not be left alone. Gasping, I scrambled to sit up and find my father. After a moment of panic I spotted him a few feet to my left and behind me. He was sitting on the ground with his eyes glued to an orange book. Noticing my scrutiny he glanced up from the book and gave me the eye crinkle that I'd come to interpret as a smile. I couldn't help smiling back, though I wondered why he so hastily tucked his book away. I was secretly a little embarrassed that I'd thought he'd abandoned me, but I chalked it up to the fact that I wasn't used to having a father. My insecurities regarding male role models were somewhat ingrained, and I was having a hard time believing he could accept my existence with such ease. The idea of having someone other than my mom there to take care of me was utterly foreign, but I couldn't help the fondness I already felt towards the strange man. I decided to showcase my only just then realized affection the only way I could, woof the stuffed dog was now hanging by its tail in my tiny fist. He raised an eyebrow and I couldn't help the giggle that escaped. Honestly. Why wasn't he utterly freaked out by my strange behavior? Even someone who knew nothing about kids should have realized I understood too much at this point. My mom was one thing, she could be utterly clueless sometimes, and chalked up my outbursts to infantile whims. Anyone else though, at least anyone with sense, would have noticed the moments of advanced thinking or reactions. I studied the man a bit closer, without ceasing my smile of course, as he sighed in resignation and came to crouch in front of me. He seems like he cold perceptive, though I could be very wrong, and he could be even more oblivious than my mother. I was interrupted from my thoughts when the man in question reached over to take the dog from my grasp with a bored expression. He held it in front of my gaze, um woof. I promptly fell over laughing and gurgling. He was just so, so ridiculous looking. He gave me a distinctly unimpressed stare, and I pushed aside my mirth in favor of playing my favorite game. Regaining my composure I shifted to my hands and knees and started crawling to the dog in his hand. I yipped and barked to the best of my ability, and I swear his eyebrow shot past his hairline. He I'll admit it, it's kind of a weird game, but my mom loves it. She makes the dog play with me as I pretend to be a puppy myself. Anyway, I crawl rapidly towards the stuffed toy and nudge it with my head, rough. Rough. When he fails to make the toy respond I shoot him a glare and do my best impression of an intimidating growl. He sighs heavily, woof. Rough. Grrrr. He's so unenthused that I roll onto my back to giggle uncontrollably. Who knew it was this fun to torture a practical stranger? He didn't seem truly annoyed though, if anything it seemed like he was faking it, but maybe that was just wishful thinking on my part. I picked myself back up quickly and rushed to the toy, which I still hadn't given a proper name. I just called him Woof Wood. It's not like I knew any Japanese names anyway. Just as I was about to pounce on Wood, he disappeared only to bop me on the head a second later. I froze, turning my head slowly. I saw my father with his eyes squinted in a smile. He seemed to be waiting to see how I'd react. If I hadn't retained some of my memories I might have cried, looked confused, or laughed. All of those would have been within the realm of normal. Most babies my age would probably fail to see the connection that their parents were controlling the dog at all. I was not, however, your typical baby. I snatched the dog from his grasp, smiled sweetly, and swiftly chucked Woof at his head. He didn't move for a moment, and I feared I'd pushed him over the edge. I held my breath to see how he'd react. Less than a moment later he slumped and heaved his most exasperated sigh yet, was that really necessary? I snorted then took to cracking up in a mixture of humor and relief. By the time I was finished I was out of breath and feeling lighthearted. Kakashi was giving me an appraising look and waiting out my laughing fit. If I were paying a little more attention I might have noticed the suspicion in his eyes, but I didn't. I finally calmed down, already feeling a tad worn out, though not enough to fall asleep again. Mid to late evening was my most active time of day. I glanced up and noted the impassive look on my father's face, he was clearly thinking about something. Deciding it was time to do my own thinking I imitated his look. Hmm. What to think about. My life I guess it's pretty simple, even boring. Wait. 
How the hell am I okay with this? I'm almost 18 sort of. Or am I really just a baby? But I seem pretty advanced, I continued to argue with myself, maybe I was supposed to forget my life by now. I paused in contemplation. Am I still Victoria? I don't even miss anything about my old life. The emotions disappeared just days after my birth. But I still remember how to read and write, not that it helps me much since I'm probably in Japan now. I halted mid-thought. Japan. This place isn't exactly full of Asians, heck people have pink hair here. And then there's the blue light. Can't be normal. I don't think I'm hallucinating either I sighed heavily. I just don't know. GRRRR. I looked up to make sure my new dad didn't notice anything strange about my expressions, but he was still lost in his own thoughts. Of course I'd already questioned my situation on multiple occasions. After less than two months in my new life I doubted I was in Japan. There were no Japanese people to back up that particular idea. Plus all the weird hair and eye colors made it hard for me to pinpoint where exactly I lived. For a while I'd thought that I was in some third world country since I never saw cars, but there were too many modern conveniences other than vehicles that made my theory implausible. The blue light was making it harder and harder for me to believe I was even on earth anymore, let alone any country I'd heard of. I'd entertained the thought that I was in some new dimension, but I didn't think it would be a magical one. I cursed my wretched luck. Only I would get electrocuted only to be whisked off to some crazy place where people glow. It would be one thing if I were reborn without memories, now I had a lifetime's worth of memories that would be utterly useless in this new world. I'll have to push my idea of normal out the window if I want to stay sane and lead my new life. I nodded to myself. Really, my only option was to just go with the flow. A new dimension slash world slash whatever wasn't that big of a deal compared to being reborn. As for the issue of being reborn with all of my old memories intact meh, I'd just have to use it as a blessing to get started on my new life. I mean, it may make it harder for me to accept all the weirdness, but at the same time it'll help me get over all the hurdles most little kids face. At least, that's how I was going to look at it, I've never been one to pointlessly depress myself. I was pretty impressed with myself. I'd thought all this and more on separate occasions, but this was the first time I'd felt so resolute. I'll admit it. It's probably the fact that I now have a father that's made me so willing to accept the cards that fate chose to deal me with. The chance to grow up with a male role model, especially one who had weird glowing powers, was too good to pass up over some lingering resentment and confusion. I died. It's about time I got over it. I chose this moment to glance back at my dad, thank you he looked at me curiously, and I pretended not to notice. He'd unwittingly just made my life a whole lot easier. All in all, I'd say my first day with my father was a success. After sitting together in the sunshine for a few hours he made my blanket and woof disappear, handed me the sunflower, and walked me back to the apartment. By the time we reached home I was anxious to see my mom. I had never been away from her for more than a few hours, and I was unusually eager to see her again. She must have felt the same because one minute Kakashi was raising a fist to knock on the door, and the next she had flung the door open herself and snatched me up. I let out a startled squeak, but relaxed when her familiar presence washed over me. It put me at ease immediately. With drowsy eyes I glanced back at the dazed figure standing just outside the door. It appeared that my mom had shocked him as much as she had me. He cooked abruptly and Chidori-chan was a good girl right? Did you have fun sweetie? Did you miss mommy? Was a bit overwhelming. I just smiled back and out of the corner of my eye, noticed that Kakashi looked distinctly uncomfortable. I shrugged it off he'd get used to my mom soon enough if he was going to be involved in my life. Instead of worrying about it I snuggled deeper into my mom's warmth. Now that I thought about it, it was strange how I felt this blooming warmth whenever I was with her. It was familiar, but I hadn't ever noticed it before. I hadn't felt it with Kakashi, though I did feel a sharp sense of calm with tingling undertones. Weird is that a baby thing that associates sensations with people. I pondered this as my mom practically dragged Kakashi into the kitchen, dropping me off on a blanket in the living room on her way. I was so worried. I thought you said you'd be back before 6. It's nearly 7 my mom's voice carried from the kitchen to the living room, and I smiled. She already seemed livelier and we'd only been back in her hometown for 2 days. I got caught up in training exercises with my team, and had to his, false, excuse was cut off by my mom's snort of disbelief. Apparently she could smell a lie, or maybe my dad was known for being an uninvolved teacher. He certainly didn't seem to pay any attention to his team, though I had assumed that was because of my being there. As he tried to placate my mother I tuned the conversation out. There's only so much I can handle with the attention span of a hamster. Instead I chose to think over the weird things I had seen and heard. Aside from the magic scroll in my dad's mystical glowing hands, I had seen weirder things. On our walk back there were people jumping from building to building. 
Then, a random guy in the street had done something with his hands and disappeared in a cloud of smoke. Deciding that fainting would be too cliche, I had chosen to take it all in with no expression whatsoever. I'm definitely in a new, magical, world. There's absolutely no way this place is the earth I know, if people could do this, I would have heard about it on the evening news. I lay down on my back to continue thinking over the weirdness of it all. I entertained the thought that everyone around me was just part of some freaky science experiment, but then I remembered the journey I'd undertaken. There was absolutely no way this could be a secret experiment, it was too large an area satellites would have spotted it if we were still on the earth I remembered. I heaved a sigh. Man, all I seem to do is sigh nowadays. Having memories of a different world would make this so weird. At least some things are consistent, I thought as I looked around the room. It was a regular old living room. There was a cream-colored couch with burgundy pillows and a dark brown coffee table right in front of it. A few pictures adorned the walls mostly landscapes. There were two comfortable armchairs across from the couch and some sort of plant in the corner. It was odd how this world was so similar to Earth. Sure, nature was a little wilder, and technology was less advanced, but there were still houses and stores and streets. The normalcy was only offset by the strange people who inhabited this world. With my new resolution to accept my fate and live my life still fresh in my mind, I made a vow to stop judging and comparing my new world to my old one. I needed to start learning. There was so much I wanted to do with my second chance. I nodded to myself and could feel a small smile forming when all of a sudden I was being lifted into the air. Chidori-chan my mom sang, it's time for bed. I guess I can't do anything when I'm sleepy anyway. I still have time to live this new life. After all, I'm just a baby for now. I soon fell into a routine. My mom worked four days a week, sometimes not returning home at all in that time frame. From what I overheard, she was doing missions. All of them were fairly close and brief, though it didn't feel that way to me. I was alternately given to my father or one of the many friends my mom had. Apparently, the three little monsters were training most of the time, so Kakashi was free to watch me. Mostly he just walked around with me or took me to his apartment, where I'd follow him from room to room. He only ever took off his mask at home, and I wondered why he wore it at all. He wasn't deformed or anything. Personally, and this is from a purely platonic point of view, I thought he was pretty handsome. The only flaw he had was the scar covering his eye. He kept that eye shut most of the time. Once, I had been curious and wanted to see his eyes. I wondered if he was missing an eye, but his eyelid didn't seem to be sunken. He had been lounging on his couch with a magazine, and I was on the floor with Woof. Deciding I could get away with it, as I was only a baby, I clambered up onto his lap. He had to help me a little, and soon I was sitting on his lap, staring straight up into his face. I reached my chubby hands up and gently prodded the scar. My coordination was shoddy, but eventually I managed to move my fingers to his eye. He gave me a calculating look and slowly opened his left eye. It was red. I stared open-mouthed at the crimson-colored orb, there were three black commas in his iris. I was shocked to say the least. As I fought to get over my own shock and confusion I noticed he was tense. Does his weird eye bother him? Is he embarrassed? No, it's something else oh. I exclaimed mentally. He's wondering how I'll react. He's anxious. The thought made me feel warm. He cared about how I saw him. Determined to prove it didn't matter, I cupped his cheek with my tiny hand and pronounced very carefully, Kakashi looks cool. He chuckled at my odd wording and gave me one of his squinty-eyed smiles. The effect without the mask was comforting, when it was gone I knew for sure that he was smiling, not just closing his eyes. The next thing I knew he was messing up my hair, though it was already pretty mussed up anyways, and our evening went back to normal. Whenever my dad was busy with his team and my mom was out on missions I was given to random shinobi and the occasional neighbor. The only people I stayed with were people my mom trusted utterly and completely. Even then she would threaten to murder them if they let anything happen to me. Everyone seemed to take her posturing with good humor. My favorite babysitter, aside from my dad, would have to be my mom's old sensei. Flashback. Nara sensei cried my mother as a tall man with a ropey scar opened the door. I studied the man who'd been my mother's teacher and couldn't help the small grin that formed when he heaved a huge sigh. Ah, a man after my own heart. Boy. Calm down Kaoru he groaned as my mother crushed him in a one-armed hug, I was on her right hip. Didn't you say you had an important mission to get to anyway? My mom shrieked in alarm. Shoot. I've gotta go with a hasty kiss goodbye she thrust me into the stranger's hands and ran off. The man heaved another sigh and glanced down at me. TCH. Troublesome. All I could do was utter a small sigh of my own. My mother had been throwing me from stranger to stranger for the past few weeks. The sudden change had thrown me off. Before, she didn't seem to trust anyone to watch me, let alone hold me. Now, here in Kanoha, I figured out the name in my second week here, she seems to trust everybody. 
To be honest, I was miffed, instead of dwelling on it, I just chose to accept it. I'd promised myself I wouldn't be a burden. Besides, my mom was much happier here than in our old town. I think she had felt somewhat trapped before. After about a week in Kanoha my mom's energy had doubled, something I didn't think was possible. Her smiles were so big it looked like her face would tear apart. She and my father got along surprisingly well, I could tell she still had feelings for him, but he was oblivious. Anyway, back to the issue at hand, I was now being shuffled from stranger to stranger. This one though, was Supposeto be special. He was my mom's teacher. I was finding it hard to believe he had ever summoned the willpower. Currently he was sitting on his back porch with me in the grass in front of him. I was laying down, twisting my fingers in the grass, when a new figure appeared. The boy for he was just a boy, no older than my father's students strolled from the house onto the porch with his hands in his pockets. Who's the bratty asked, his voice a bored drawl. I turned my head to give him a half-hearted glare before I gave up and went back to my half-asleep trance. Not a brat and Chidori I murmured before closing my eyes. She's a kid of one of my old students said the elder Nara, whom I assumed was his son. She's not as troublesome as she looks Dottie paused for a moment, had a Kakashi as her father. I could see the kid whip his head back around to stare at me when he heard that. I guess I can see that his thoughtful expression was replaced by a smirk. Especially with that weird hair. I didn't bother to feel offended my hair is ridiculous. So when he heaved a sigh nearly identical to his dad's and lay down in the grass beside me with his hands behind his head, I just shrugged internally. We sat there for the rest of the day until I was collected by my mom. It was nice actually, not being expected to do anything at all. From then on, I had two lazy day companions. Then flashback. Things settled into a pattern and continued for a time. Eventually my dad's team's exams arrived. He seemed a little tense when he was alone with me the days leading up to the start, but he showed none of that tenseness in public. As for me, I spent a lot of my time devoted to feeling things. You see, I noticed that the feelings I'd associated with my parents were not limited to them. All the so-called ninja had a distinct feeling to them. As I focused on it I was able to get the feeling even when I wasn't touching them. While time continued to pass I could feel the same thing developing inside of my own body. Mine was jerky and erratic. It buzzed beneath my skin, much like my dad's. Days would go by and it continued to grow. Soon I was convinced it was electricity. That's what it felt like to me. Surprisingly this didn't bother me, despite my previous life's demise. In all actuality, my death was too sudden and painless for it to leave any lingering fear or anxiety. Exactly two weeks before the tune-in exams I was able to manifest the energy under my skin. In my room, in the dark one night, I was able to send a little light blue-white bolt of static back and forth between my fingertips. It didn't hurt and I was thrilled with the new development. It was then that I realized I was using my very own chakra, just like my parents and the other ninjas had. The part of me was thrilled well, okay Aleph me was thrilled. How many times had I wished for cool superpowers in my old life? The answer to that question was many, many times. Yeah, my new life was definitely not so bad. I was looking forward to the future. It's really too bad how life always seems to get complicated right after you finally come to terms with the way things are going. My life steady rhythm remained uninterrupted up until the start of the Chunin exam. My father's team of gen in the term I learned applied to recent graduates of the ninja school, was going to take part in order to go up in rank to dot. Along with learning this, I had gained a better sense of the world I lived in. I was a little over 8 months old and was finally strong enough, curse you baby muscle mass. To walk around regularly. I didn't worry about seeming too advanced in my old life I had started walking at the same time. It was odd, just like in my old life I was extremely small for my age. Other mothers asked my mom if I had been born premature, my old mother had been asked the same thing back in that other world. I figured it was a coincidence. Though it did make me wonder about what other similarities would crop up as I grew up for a second time. Anyway, back to what I came to understand. The world I now inhabited was very militaristic. There were normal people and then there were the ninjas. The normal people were just like people from Earth they didn't have weird powers, and they held normal jobs. The ninjas, however, were where the worlds diverged. I suppose it's because of their weird powers and abilities that the technology seems to stagnate in some areas while advancing in others. For example, if you could traverse an entire city in mere seconds by jumping across roofs with chakra, then why would you feel the need to invent things like cars and buses? Another thing I learned is that there were hidden villages and that I lived in the village, hidden in the leaves. Yeah, I still don't really get that either. Also, these villages were surprisingly cutthroat when it came to one another. They seemed overly antagonistic in my opinion, but I couldn't be sure as to why my observations came from overhearing adults discuss their suspicion toward incoming foreign ninjas. And although, those things were some of the least surprising things that I learned about my new world. 
In a way I guess the older aspects of my mentality held suspicions, but when I had them confirmed. Surprised it doesn't even cover it. I mean, I could adapt to the fact that there were strange powers all around me easily enough, but it was what those powers were used for that startled me. Okay, at first it was fine, throwing fireballs or brandishing swords at bandits seemed pretty reasonable to me. The spying was a bit weird, but then I remembered the Cold War and felt like I couldn't judge. It was the shadier aspects of a ninja's life that freaked me out. I had an Amiga Thacopia plumament after I heard about an assassination job. Yeah people don't really temper their words much when they think you're a tiny, uncomprehending baby. At the time I had been rolling around on the carpet in the living room trying to build up static. I was really bored there's not much to do as a baby. Besides, what better way to spend your day than annoying the hell out of everyone else? Using a bit of the chakra that I held under my control helped speed the process along immensely. It took some concentration, but it worked so well that I could almost feel the tingling underneath my skin. Once I decided that I'd built up enough of a charge to shock my mom with a toddler into the kitchen. As soon as I entered I heard the following. And the new guy, with the blue hair, had to go and make a racket tripping over a glass case full of antiques. Of course this wakes everybody up, including our target. Arg. I hate working with rookies. My mom just shook her head in exasperation, how'd you get out of that one? That's the best part. He had hired a couple of ninja from grass which normally wouldn't be a problem considering our level, and they completely outnumbered us. I was just about to call a retreat and regroup when the new guy flips out. I meandered over to the kitchen table, eager to hear more. So get this, the target rushes out of his bedroom, and his guards come in from their posts at top speed. New guy wants to play the hero and makes for the target like the grass ninja aren't even there. Then bam. He's sent flying three steps in, and his kunai goes spinning out of his hand here she starts to laugh. Want to know where it ends up my mom nods her head eagerly, and I hold my breath. Right. Between. The. Targets. Eyes. My mom and her friends sit there chuckling as I stare in horror. I mean, spying and possibly killing bandits is a tad gray from a moral standpoint, but assassination I don't even joke about murder and umph one who actually knows what happens when you die. Okay, it's not like it was all that graphic or anything, but I think I was having some issues before I heard that. I mean, I and ninjas were a deadly force. I just didn't know how well that sat with my leftover morals. My old life's memories were vague when it came to most aspects of my actual life, but I retained a good portion of general knowledge. Thanks to that I remembered things like right and wrong, life and death. I guess I had started to think of ninjas as something akin to police officers or government agents. I mean, I'm sure CIA FBI agents sometimes resort to violence and spying for national security reasons. I wasn't entirely wrong. Ninjas worry a lot like that. It's just that they did a whole lot more than anything I could relate to from my old world. Being a ninja was about as varied a job as you could imagine. I'm not going to lie, I'm still not entirely aware of all that being a ninja entails, beauty am no aware of one aspect of the job that wasn't condoned at all in my old world murder. Yup. Cold-blooded murder. In some respects this part of the job should have been the easiest for me to guess at, considering that was more along the lines of what I knew of ninjas from my old life. In reality, my naivety, caused in part by being a baby again, made me oblivious to the darker side of ninja life. I had thought, with ninjas being so strange here, that they used the term ninja loosely. Sometimes they seem like the Japanese ninjas I remember from before, but most of the time they seem like do it all magical aids. Trust me, none of the ninjas my mom knows dress in all black or carry nunchucks, from what I've seen. I had assumed that the ninjas here were only called ninjas due to the way they could sneak around and blend in. Nope. I was wrong. The ninjas in my new world are trained killers. My mom carries throwing knives on her person at all times for Pete's sake. After that conversation I picked up on the shadier side of things more and more often. You know, I'm really surprised I got over my initial shock and horror so quickly. Yeah I'm blaming the fact that I'm really more of a baby than a teenager in this new life. Sure I remember a few things about my culture, even things I learned in school, sort of, but mostly all I remember is really basic rules of life. For one, I understand that I am a small child, a baby really, and that I will grow up into an adult one day. Another thing I know is that there's a whole language to learn so that I can express myself. That must be frustrating for all those normal babies. If I didn't have the basic words and gestures down from observation and prior knowledge, I'd be a heck of a lot fussier from the frustration. Jeez. It had to suck if you felt hungry or tired and couldn't even know how to tell others yet. No wonder babies and toddlers throw such tantrums. It's true that I didn't understand much of the language, especially when you considered its structure, but I was great with the general gist of things. That, and I was especially perceptive with regards to facial expressions and silent cues. Some things really are universal. 
Not that I even know if I'm in the same universe, eh, whatever. Okay, so I might still think of myself as a teenage girl in a child's body, but that wasn't really what I was. Most of the time I was thinking things like. My mommy's so warm. Or. I feel sleepy. And sometimes. My toes are cute haha. They're wiggling. Okay, not my proudest moment there, but you get the picture. In fact, my old life was fading quickly from even the deepest recesses of my memory. I would have been scared if I hadn't genuinely enjoyed my new life so much. The only times it ever became clearer and my thought processes faster was when I used the chakra of my new world. It couldn't just be the regular stuff either. No. It had to be the electric stuff. I could speed up and slow down my blue chakra flow when I played with it, sometimes even making my hands glow. It was when I gave it that little nudge to change to the rippling electricity I enjoyed so much that my mind seemed to open. That led me to circulating the gentle current through the chakra paths in my head one night. I had, even with my increasingly infantile thought processes, noticed the memory enhancement the lighting light chakra gave me. So at night, when my mom had me sleep in my crib rather than her bed I would experiment. It was one week before the tune-in exams that I made my first real breakthrough, in theory at least. My mind was working quickly as I circulated little shocks back and forth between my fingertips. Suddenly I had an aha moment. I had taken AP courses for chemistry, biology, and physics in high school. I knew that the nervous system and the brain ran on electrical impulses, and I knew from experience that my brain was functioning better when I was channeling my electricity. Yet yeah, in my defense I would have noticed sooner if I weren't so busy being a baby. Anyway, I finally connected the dots. I had noticed, when I concentrated, that my chakra tended to change on its own and continue circulating through my body in its electric form. I didn't know why it had the tendency to do that, but I suspected my death had something to do with my affinity for the element. Or, it was just a really ironic coincidence. I came to the conclusion that the extra electricity in my chakra system was responsible for my knowledge from before. I figured with all the extra charge circulating in my brain that it was more active than it should be. Have you ever heard about how much of the human brain is actually used? It's not 10% or anything ridiculous like that, but it's true that humans do not use all of their brain power at once, ever. I think, along with keeping my hippocampus, the part of the brain that deals with long-term memory, amped up along with any other parts of the brain dealing with memory, it also boosted other parts of my mind. Basically, my chakra prevented me from forgetting my old life and made it easy for me to pick up the language and adapt to my new one. The knowledge was still fading, but all I had to do was charge up my brain and focus on my past to draw up my memories. Though I had less and less of a reason to do it as time went on. I would always have an impeccable memory, speedy thought processes, and quick reflexes, thanks to my weird chakra. At first I wondered if there were others like me, but I dismissed that when I was taken to the doctor for having an active chakra system so young. Apparently, I was a downright freak of nature when it came to being able to access and control my chakra as a baby. That didn't make me feel any better at being poked and prodded at, so I bit the magic chakra doctor that had been examining me the day after my mom caught me messing with my sparks. Yes, they have magic chakra doctors. No, I'll never believe them when they say it's not magic. Chakra is cool and all, but healing injuries in seconds. Definitely magic. But I digress. So that night a week before the tune-in exams I finally came up with some answers to my situation. They might not have been right, but they were all I was going to get. After that I continued my routine like normal and tried to avoid drawing up memories with my sparks. Forgetting didn't seem so bad anymore. What was the point of holding on to something so irrelevant to my current life? Instead I decided to use my advantage in ways that would set me up to enjoy life to its fullest. I had been smart before, if a bit lazy, and probably would be again. The difference this time was that smart was taking on a whole new meaning. I had the learning curve of a baby toddler along with a supercharged brain. I was Sue taking advantage of that. What was doing well on the SAT compared to being a true genius? Haha. <laughs> this world won't know what hit it. I spent the morning of the first part of the exam with my mom. She babbled on and on about her own exam. I kept up with what she was saying by circulating some extra electric chakra in my brain. If I hadn't been growing accustomed to this warlike world, I would have been outraged at what these people exposed their children to. Now, however, I was being shaped by my environment and I took the news in stride. In my head I prayed that all three of my dad's students would make out okay. They'd grown on me in the short time I'd spent with them. The blonde was convinced I was his minion or something, while the pink girl wanted to coo over me, and the snotty brat pretended he couldn't be bothered with me, which I didn't believe, considering he watched me like a hawk while I explored and kept me away from dangerous things. Still, I was fond of all of them, and their tenacity was something to be admired. It was surprising actually, I couldn't believe they got anything done with my dad as their sensei. 
Actually, I think my presence helped some. When my dad tried to ignore the kids when I was there I would glare and point a tiny finger in his face while saying, play white team or, help brats. Other than grimacing when a baby called them brats, the kids thought it was funny that I was repeating after my mom. She had come to get me from my dad once and saw how he didn't teach very well, or at all really. She spent that week coaching the team herself, while all the while reprimanding my dad for not helping them to reach their potential as shinobi of Konoha. My dad just looked sheepish but resigned. To be honest I don't think he really knew how to go about teaching. In my mind he was using his laziness as an excuse for his ignorance. The kids certainly seemed happier when my mom and I made him take a more hands-on approach. Naruto, the blonde, acted out less, while Sakura was happy that she was getting better than she thought she could be. Apparently the pink-haired girl had decided that she needed to be clever and strong enough to be a worthy wife for the Sasuke kid. She wasn't as strong, fast, or as determined as the other two, but apparently she was getting pretty good with her chakra illusions. My dad seemed to appreciate the fact that while she still frowned over the moody kid, she did get some more training in comparison with before. I couldn't tell what the Sasu kid was thinking, but he was always up for learning and mastering new skills as quickly as he could. He even seemed less annoyed with Naruto once my dad finally went over some basic skills with him that the others already knew. But the kids acting more mature he sometimes left me in their care. Not without some death threats, glares, and creepy eye smiles, but I'm pretty sure it was his way of saying he trusted them. Besides, I don't think he was ever far. He was close enough to step in and help if he had to. The kids weren't all that bad. All they ever seemed to talk about were their ninja assignments and how their teammates made fools of themselves. Most of the time a mission consisted of gardening or delivering messages. It probably helped that I felt bad for them. I did a lot, and I mean a lot, of babysitting in my day, and I knew it could be stressful. So I smiled at them and went along with their games. I actually had fun since I was losing my adult late teen mentality. Okay, so I might not have ever really had that in this new life, but I definitely had a mind on the same level as my preteen self on occasion, with the aid of my chakra. I was in many ways the baby I appeared to be, I had the advanced learning curve that all infants and toddlers have, as well as the somewhat shortened attention span. Though as time went on I found it easier to understand more and more of the language, which helped me stay well above normal infant level. It especially helped that I already knew basic things from being reincarnated, so that all my extra learning power could go into learning the language in my new culture. So with all that coming into play I was able to use the kids to explore my new world and experience a great childhood at the same time. Unfortunately my heightened sense of awareness meant I worried excessively over whether they'd be alright in the exam. That's why, when my mom finally handed me off to my dad who was on the way to wish his team luck for the start of the exam, I was squirming anxiously and trying desperately to keep the extra chakra flow to my brain to stay informed of what was going on. I couldn't afford to lapse into carefree baby mode when the kids were about to go into a dangerous and possibly fatal test. Unfortunately focusing on and redirecting the electric chakra to my brain was a lot harder to do when I was worried. Shooting sparks from hand to hand then up to my brain before going down to the original hand was easier and required less focus, but I was being carried and couldn't get my hands into position. My dad must have noticed my agitation because he patted my head and held me a little more securely. I relaxed a bit so I wouldn't worry him and focused on the fact that everyone else was sure everything would be fine. Surely they all knew more about this than I did. So Sasuke, the prodigy who was adamant that he was the most intelligent and talented member of my dad's team, had gotten into a fight with a fellow Leaf Genin right before the start of the first exam. Yeah, that's what I said. I'd expect something like that from short, blonde, and hyper not moody, dark, and serious. Oh well, I suppose he isonly a kid, and doesn't that sound silly coming from a baby? That, I could understand and forgive, but I'm beginning to think there's something seriously wrong with that kid. I'll get to that in a minute though first let me catch you up to speed. It's been a little over a month since the start of the exam, and I haven't seen my father at all following the second stage. The day the second stage ended he came to my mom's apartment building late in the evening, my mom had left after receiving some sort of message, and I was with our elderly neighbors, and told me he was going to be busy, but that I'd see him after the exam was over. I didn't do much more than pout, not wanting to give away how much I really understood at nearly a year old. He'd ruffled my static Y hair and disappeared only minutes after arriving. So not okay my dad was officially terrible at goodbyes. I had sulked and ignored the old couple looking after me for the entire two hours, until my mom finally returned. Not one to mope for long, I gave that up when I saw my mom's worried frown, and I played the part of a happy baby in the weeks that followed. Most of the time my mom was gone security had been upped with all the foreigners present, and I was left with any number of strange people. At one point I was left with my mom's old teacher and his wife for two days. 
It had actually been the best since they had pet deer that would come up and nibble on grass just a few feet away if I kept still. Other than that I was passed from stranger to acquaintance to friend at random. I was even left with a couple of children around the same age as my dad's students. It was with great relief that I nestled into my mom's side the day of the tournament. My dad said he would visit again after the exam ended, and my mom had apologized for being so busy lately I was looking forward to having both my parents full attention again. Hey, call me selfish, but being adored is I'll waste them. I chan, look at that at my mom's voice I turned my head to stare at a massive stadium I'd never been to before. Junin. Brats ha. I loved calling them brats, it was only better when I got to do it to their faces. My mom laughed and shifted me to her other hip before going off on some tangent. I swear, it's like she thought I was her own personal diary sometimes. I didn't bother paying attention. I could use my chakra to pay attention for 20 minutes straight before conking out but no more. I was planning on watching the most exciting parts of my brat's fights and resting in between. I chan my mom cooed, beaming at me. You get to see the boys and your daddy again. Did you miss them? I nodded vigorously. The only member of Team 7 that I'd seen had been Sakura, she hadn't made it through to the third stage. The boys and my dad were off training for it, and I hadn't even caught a glimpse of them in ages. I was actually having trouble remembering their faces when I didn't circulate chakra. My mom and I joined the rather large and rambunctious crowd moving to their seats. Soon I found myself in a section for the ninja of our village. All around me were metal headbands, green vests, and the little leg pouches every ninja seemed to have. After a few minutes of shuffling and shifting as everyone found their seats and got settled in, my mom drew my attention to the open area below. That's where you have to look to see Naruto and Sasuke fight. Blondie's up first, so keep an eye out. In response I sat up straighter in her lap and narrowed my eyes at the three figures below. Sure enough, one of the figures had shockingly bright blonde hair. There was another kid and an adult, probably a referee, I guessed, standing with him. Childishly I ignored the hush that had spread as the first fight was about to begin and turned to my mom. Whose girl I cut my eyes back to the brunette with straight hair halfway down her back. My mom choked on a laugh as Snickers broke out around us. Boy, Kai-chan. That's a boy. Deciding to have a laugh and get away with it due to my supposed childish innocence, seriously, who'd suspect a one-year-old of yanking their chain? I scrunched my nose in faux confusion. But but girl. Ha. Not knowing the language made it even funnier. A guy with brown hair to his shoulders sitting beside us was clutching his side as he laughed. Okay Oru. I can already tell your daughter's going to be just like you. My mom smirked. Yeah, she is. She'll be my little hellion won't you Kai-chan? I nodded solemnly like I always did when my mom used that tone. I vaguely understood what was going on, but decided to stop even the tiny bit of circulating I was doing in an attempt to conserve chakra. So I sat back and waited for something down below to garner enough attention for me to snap back into focus. My method worked best when I was either frustrated or curious, I figured cool parts of the fight would awaken my curiosity so that I could watch the show. I didn't have to wait long. Soon, crazy things were happening, and every time I thought the fight was over Naruto got right back up. I was mostly shocked by the fact that he could split into multiples. I mean, I'd seen him duplicate himself before, but to make so many copies was freaky. Even more surprising was how quickly and devastatingly the boy girl would strike. Even I could tell that Naruto was getting the stuffing beaten out of him. It was mind-boggling how much pain he could take and keep going anyone else should be dead. And then, most surprising of all, he won. The rest of the crowd actually looked on in stunned silence for a beat before the cheering broke out. Hi Chan. Clap like Ka Chan very slowly and dramatically brought her hands together, and I imitated her. Now we get to watch Sasuke. Aren't you excited I had already used up half my chakra on the very first match, so I was glad that Sasuke was up next that way I'd have a chance to rest before the second round. Unfortunately this leads to where I am right now. Sitting in a crowd waiting for my dad's student to show up for the match. The very same match that he's known about for a month. How could he forget? All around me the spectators are whispering and complaining. The referee person has even had to leave the arena to talk to the village leader or, Hokage, I mean to figure out what's going on. I just know it's my dad's fault. Everyone's always bemoaning the fact that he's incapable of being on time, and now he's passed it on to his student erg. Did you hear the Kai Chan startled, I glanced back up to my mom's smiling face. He's not disqualified. They pushed his match back so that he still has a chance. Daughter smile becomes a bit strained, and her eye twitches a bit. Of course this would be a problem if your father had just gotten him here on time. Promise me you won't turn out like your daddy Kai Chan. You'll be punctual just like Ka Chan, ne? Instead of answering my mom's earnest plea I choose to yawn instead. I only really picked up every other word or so, and that was with great effort. 
I'd gotten the gist of what she'd said after a moment of thought, by using the words I did know, but I saw no need to play along this time. I was a tad keyed up from the first match. Aoru sighed in resignation and turned back to the arena in time for one of the contestants to shout something, and a roar of protests rose amongst the spectators. I didn't catch what it was, but soon enough the voices died down, and the son of my mom's old sensei and a girl were facing off down below. My mom and the man next to us kept up a steady commentary that I only vaguely paid attention to. It wasn't until my mom suddenly stiffened that I turned back to her. Her head was cocked to the side slightly, and her eyes were darting around. A split second later she was back to normal with a smile on her face. Excuse me she said to the brunette beside us. I'm going to run to the bathroom I'll be right back dot with that she lifted me to her hip and walked into the deserted hallway that led to the restrooms. I nearly squeaked aloud when a masked shinobi appeared as if from thin air. He walked straight up to my mother and started whispering in her ear. Unfortunately, it was the ear on her right side and I was on her left hip, so I didn't catch what he said. I did, however, catch my mother's loud and rather angry response. Why wasn't I informed? I know I'm currently on reserve, but that's no excuse. My daughter could have been caught in the crossfire Kaora's eyes were flashing, and she was holding me almost painfully tight. I'm sorry but the Hokage didn't want it to spread around. He was afraid a mass panic would break out, or that one of the other nation's ninjas would realize our suspicions. The man placed both of his hands on my mother's shoulders. The only thing that matters is that you and your daughter get out of here you're not fully in shape, and your daughter is in danger. You're right whispered Kaoru. I've got to go. Thanks, a oh but a moment later our surroundings blurred and I squirmed in my mother's arms. Stop. Stop I cried. She did, switching me to her other hip as she tried to shush me. Quiet Chidori daughter voice was firm and calm. I stopped my protest abruptly, startled at her use of my actual name. She held me against her chest and put her hand on the back of my head. Don't move sweetie and with that we blurred away again. Quite suddenly we were home and my mom was packing a bag with diapers and bottles. I had to frown a bit at the diapers I couldn't wait until I was coordinated enough for that to be over with. I stumbled clumsily over to my stuffed dog on the couch. It took a bit of finagling, but in the end I pulled Woof down and clutched him in my chubby little arms. After that I turned my steadily darkening blue eyes on my mother. What? What sigh? As much as I understood and picked up on words, there were only a few that I could pronounce clearly, I lisped a bit with my s's. Thankfully my mother picked up on the fact that I wanted to be reassured because she kneeled down and opened her mouth. Boom. My mother and I both froze with our heads cocked to the sides. And then I was in her arms, and the baby bag was slung over her other shoulder, as she snatched up a few more things. Peoru was furiously muttering things under her breath curses, no doubt, and I clung to her in fear. Obviously she knew something bad was going to happen, and I absently wondered if it was a terrorist attack or something. At any other time I would have been committing the curse words to memory, but I was way too freaked out at the moment. Old on Kai Chan. I barely had time to bury my face in my mother's shoulder when our apartment blurred around us. Soon our surroundings came back into focus, and my mother was leaping from rooftops towards the giant cliff with the four faces. Another booming crash sounded and a series of small explosions followed. My mom was holding me with too much force, and I realized belatedly I was crying silently in fear and anxiousness. And that's when the horrible, awful screaming broke out. It was dark. That was the first thing that came to mind when my mom left me in the tunnels. She passed me off like some sort of package into a stranger's arms and left. It shouldn't have been surprising really, I knew mom was part of the village's military, obviously she would have things to do in the case of a terrorist attack. It still hurts. Being handed off to someone like she didn't care what happened to me was too cruel. I knew intellectually that wasn't the case, but I was scared and stressed and. She just left me few obnoxious wailing and pathetic sniffles the woman holding me had been familiar to my mother but not to me she tried bouncing me which made me sick cooing ineffectual and making funny faces mildly humorous but that's beside the point i only quieted down when we settled in a room already filled with other people there were other children my age and older in the dank room i didn't want to start a round of crying or amplify any feelings of fear and uncertainty so i lay stiffly in the stranger's arms of course, I wasn't really thinking in so many words, it was more along the lines of bad feeling, no cry, makes worse since I was still adrenaline high and running on little to no chakra. The underground caves were filled with a tense silence only broken by the ninja who came by periodically to check on us. I assumed they were rotating through and checking other rooms in the caves, since I never saw the same face twice. I have no idea how long it was before something from outside caused a vibration powerful enough to rain dust down on our heads. By that point the woman holding me noticed that I was shaking in exhaustion and fear. She'd been remarkably level-headed about the whole situation and much less tense than the other civilians. 
The woman tutted disapprovingly and lifted a glowing green hand to my head. All that followed was darkness. When I next woke up I was in a different pair of arms. I could tell right away since whoever had me was definitely male. I didn't recognize him, but he was young looking and holding me carefully enough that I decided to stay calm. He looked to be in his late teens and was moving slowly up a set of steps along with at least three other adults. Right away, I recognized the one to her left as the elderly woman who'd knocked me out and sent a tiny glare her way before focusing on the group as a whole. It was difficult to tell from my awkward position, but it appeared that a gaggle of children was being led to some as yet unknown location. Even the teenager holding me had a four or five year old on his shoulders, in addition to me in his arms. The kid in question had pretty teal eyes and chestnut brown hair that fell in waves to just below his ears. Had his hair been any longer I would have thought him a girl. Hey the boy spoke up. The baby's awake. The teen, who was likely a ninja considering his ugly vest, glanced down at me briefly and gave a noncommittal grunt. The boy wasn't deterred. Aren't babies supposed to cry all the time? Why isn't she crying? Is there something wrong with her? What's her name anyway? Does. Please stop asking questions the ninja interrupted in a monotone. The baby is quiet because I have a headache and she doesn't want me to feel even worse than I already do. I suggest you follow her example. The brief silence followed before the man beside us suddenly started coughing. The two little girls he was leading by the hand worriedly asked if he was alright as he struggled to contain his amusement. The little boy, who had paused for a moment to consider the ninja's words, suddenly frowned and stared down at me. How'd she know? Does she have a bloodline limit he reached over the man's shoulder to poke my cheek. Knowing someone has a headache doesn't seem very useful. Oh look. We're here. I guess you'll have to ask someone else your questions, by the man passed us off to a harried looking woman and disappeared in a swirl of leaves. The rest of the day proved equally confusing. I spent most of my time in the makeshift daycare that had been set up in what appeared to be a school. From what I could tell, we were there so that our parents could come and find us as soon as they were free. My mom arrived in the late afternoon. I breathed a quiet sigh of relief when I saw that aside from some scratches and bruising up and down her arms, she was fine. We left the makeshift daycare after she flashed her ID and filled out a form. Almost immediately after stepping out of the building we were accosted by three dogs, two large ones and one small pug. I could feel my eyes go round in my head. I forwent any sort of attempt at proper communication and thrust my arms in their direction. Woof I cried ecstatically. Woof, woof. My mom struggled not to drop me as I lurched forward. Kai Chan she fixed her gaze on the pug. Sorry about this. She has a bit of a fascination with dogs. The pug seemed to puff up a little before speaking in an unnaturally deep voice. It's as it should be. We're a proud and noble race. I felt my jaw drop even as my mom snorted and said something in response. What in the world? Oh god, I've seen some strange things in this universe, but talking dogs I continued to gape, even as my thoughts whirled. Either this is a dream come true or this universe has insanely realistic tech. I stayed in my state of numb shock for another long moment, before a burst of delighted, slightly hysterical, laughter bubbled up. Because whatever the explanation was I didn't care. There was a talking doggy in front of me, and he was too cute for words. Ha-chan. Dog. Kai-chan wants a dog. Dog play Kai-chan. Aoru sighed and ran a hand through my hair. In a little while sweetie. We're going to go see Kakashi okay? Kakashi erg, that damn sh sound is impossible. Yeah, Kakashi. My mom pressed me tightly to her chest and pushed off the ground, sending us into the air and over the rooftops. The journey this time was a lot smoother than the one before the attack started. I closed my eyes and enjoyed the cool breeze, wondering if I could convince my mom to do this more often. Soon enough we stopped, having reached our destination. I was surprised, then worried, when I realized it was the hospital. I'd been so worried about my mom I hadn't even spared a thought for my father. I felt a flood of guilt wash through me and swallow heavily. As we followed the dogs through the hallways my mind came up with increasingly awful possibilities. It wasn't until I glimpsed him leaning against the wall just outside one of the hospital rooms that I breathed a sigh of relief. Yo he said with a nod towards me and my mom. I would have thought him completely nonchalant with our arrival if I hadn't caught the minute slumping of his shoulders when we came into view. Heoru had apparently noticed his relief as well, if the way she handed me over without a word was anything to go by. It was hard to believe I had gone so long without seeing him a month was practically an eternity to a child. As he held me tightly, but gently, to his chest I took a deep breath in, surprised when I recognized his scent. I hadn't even known I'd picked up a discernible scent to associate with my father until that moment. There was a bit of smoke and sweat, but underneath that I could smell the mild soap he used, the earth, and a hint of metal. I relaxed then, finally losing the underlying tension I'd been carrying all day. 
I stayed aware only long enough to find out that the hospital room belonged to Sakura, who had yet to wake up after having her cracked ribs healed. I didn't know how it happened, but knowing she was going to be fine satisfied my curiosity for the moment. Naruto was sitting uncharacteristically still by her bedside, staring past her with a solemn expression. He was covered in dirt, but, like my mom, the worst of his injuries appeared to be bruises and scrapes. Sasuke was nowhere to be found, but when my mom asked, Kakashi mentioned that he had left as soon as they heard Sakura would recover with no complications. I thought it a bit callous, as she'd probably like to see all her teammates when she woke up, but he was probably tired after the chaos of the attack, and had never been one for open displays of affection anyway. I yawned and released the tentative hold on my higher thought processes. After the day I'd had, I deserved a real nap. That's what I ran as fast as I could towards the far side of the room and took a running jump onto my father's hospital bed. I ignored his pain groan and shifted to pull a stack of paper from my backpack. Hi Chan he grunted. You're hurting me. I looked down, saw that I was sitting on his knees and hastily moved so that I was sitting beside his prone form not on it. Hey old man I said with a smile, ignoring his eye roll. I was going through a phase where I only ever called him dad when I was mad or worried about him. I'm glad you're back. Kasen says hi by the way. Your mom's not even going to check on me. Ask me how I'm doing Kakashi sounded incredulous, which, okay, wasn't all that unfounded. Usually my mom was hounding him to take care of himself acting more like his mother than the mother of his child. Not showing up the minute she heard he was in the hospital was way out of character. I gave him a cheery smile, one at odds with what I was about to say, of course not. Not after you disregarded her warning to be more careful on missions. The last time he'd ended up in the hospital, she told him she refused to raise me on her own, and that if he died, she would burn his romance novels. Besides, I continued, she's got a hot date tonight. Akashi groaned. He'd probably deduced, correctly, that Kaoru would be going to him for girl talk as soon as she got over her hissy fit. I leaned over and patted the top of his head. There, there. I'll help distract her if you teach me how to jump like a ninja. He sighed. I almost missed the days when she was madly in love with me. I scoffed, realizing that at 4 I wouldn't be expected to remember that. Sure, sure. I'll believe that when Tenzu learns how to act like a normal human being. Did somebody say my name? I flinched and would have tumbled off the hospital bed if not for the hands hooked under my armpits. You've got to stop doing that. Doing what the creep had the audacity to look confused. Appearing every time I say your name I snapped, clutching my heart. Do I? You do my dad and I coursed. I glared a bit until the young man laughed sheepishly and averted his eyes. Anyway he said with a cough. I've just come to let you know that Lady Tsunade's threatened to Tenzu's eyes darted toward me, and he leaned in to whisper in Kakashi's ear. If you don't stay here for the entirety of your prescribed bed rest. My dad's face had paled at whatever Tenzu whispered, and a full body shudder overtook him. Understood he croaked. By the way, I'll be leading your subordinates on the upcoming mission, since you won't be recovered in time to go dotty pause to let that sink in. Oh, and you can call me Yamato from now on. How the hell does that work? Choosing to ignore the insanity that is my father's subordinate, I waited for the rest of their conversation to end. I didn't bother paying attention, seeing as they were using their freaky sign language to communicate what I suppose was information not meant for delicate ears. PFFT, if only they knew. Suddenly, my dad and Tenzu halted in their silent conversation and shared a look. Before I could ask, Tenzu waved goodbye and disappeared through the window. Almost immediately after he disappeared a knock sounded at the door to my dad's private room. My dad didn't bother to tell me to act like Tenzu was never there, some things you just pick up on after a few years of living in this strange world. Aka-sensei I watched in bemusement as Naruto the same one who I had only the faintest memories of barged into the room with Sakura knee right behind him. Naruto with a powerful hit to the head Sakura sent the blonde teen careening into the wall. You don't just rush into someone's hospital room without their permission. There's a reason why I knocked. My dad and I shared a look that clearly said, like causing a violent commotion in a patient's room is any better. Luckily, we both had enough sense to never say this aloud where the girl could hear, or we would be the ones sporting pulsating lumps on our temples. Ouch. As much as I enjoyed watching Sakura beat on those unfortunate enough to evoke her wrath, I decided to interrupt the two, so I could introduce myself to Naruto. I'd only seen the pink-haired girl with any regularity, and was eager to actually talk with another former student of my dad's. Sasuke had apparently become some sort of enemy of the state, or whatever it was called here. I doubted I'd ever get to see him again. Hey, Sakura Ni. Who's that with you? I tilted my head cutely and watched with bemusement as she dropped the dizzy blonde she'd been shaking back and forth to skip over to my dad's hospital bed. I chan she lifted me up and threw me in the air as I laughed delightedly. 
This was the main reason why I loved the girl so much, she was great fun to play with, and was careful and controlled enough that I never got hurt, even when she threw me 50 feet into the air, only when we were outside of course. Yeah, super strength was awesome. This is Naruto she introduced. The knuckle-headed ninja we told you about and our teammate. Hi Naruto I said with a smile and a brief bow with my head. It's nice to meet you. Ignoring my greeting, Naruto turned to Kakashi and back to me with a suspicious look. Na, Kaka-sensei, are you sure Kai-chan's your daughter? I mean, she isn't wearing a mask or reading. She seems normal. My dad groaned. Naruto, the things people do aren't necessarily inherited traits. Not recognizing the word Naruto used, I interjected. What's a novel? Do you mean those novels Oyaji reads? Naruto started laughing, Sakura pinched the bridge of her nose, and my dad just looked sheepish. Yu Yu Naruto gasped. You tell her they're romance novels. Embarrassed at not understanding the conversation's turn, though I had a suspicion I deliberately avoided thinking about it, I changed the subject. Hey Naruto-san, Sakura ni, would you like to see the pictures I drew? I came to show my dad, but you can look too. Naruto opened his mouth, but shut it again quickly when Sakura stepped on his foot. We'd love to see them Kai-chan. Smiling, I pulled them out. It had taken me weeks, but I'd finally finished drawing the three pictures to my satisfaction. For a little kid, they were really good. I handed the picture of my dad, without his mask, to him and the other two to Sakura and Naruto. The teen zoomed and ate at the Hokage Monument and the picture of Sakura smiling. I'd been especially excited to draw Sakura, since she had such exotic coloring. Wow, Kai-chan Sakura said with a light blush, clearly pleased with the flattering drawing, they're wonderfully done. Thanks I smiled happily at her and gestured to my dad. Trade with Oyaji. I drew him without his mask, which was hard since he's almost always wearing it, I trailed off in shock as Naruto and Sakura practically leapt onto Kakashi in an attempt to snatch the drawing. My dad fought them valiantly, but eventually lost to their superior strength, he was stuck on bed rest for a reason. The two teams huddled together a few meters away and slowly raised the picture to eye level. Nuo they shouted in unison. Naruto turned towards my dad and cracked his knuckles, Sakura looming presence beside him. That's a Kaka sensei I'm gonna figure out what's under that mask if it's the last thing I do. While the two teens playfully strangled my dad I hopped off the bed and moved to pick up my discarded drawing. I froze just as I reached it. My picture, the one that had taken weeks to perfect, had a mask-shaped hole where my dad's face was supposed to be. I took in the charred edges of the hole and the bits of ash sitting on my father's lap and put two and two together. Dusan, 